to the countdown. Hello, everybody. Hi. I hear a slight, slight static in our uh, stream. Did anybody else hear that besides me? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Uh, well, that is the joys of live stream, and I'm hoping that we have a really great live stream today. We should. We're talking about Colts versus Colts. A lot of you guys actually signed up to watch this one. Uh, we have some guests here. Um, we're going to probably work on the audio issues in the background. We did have a sound check before and it was perfect. <laughs> Always the way. <laughs> Always the way, right? Um, so I'm going to go ahead and set the stream and uh, share the stream. I've just shared it in a few groups. Okay, great. And I'm going to get us set up on Twitter. And in the meantime, we can welcome our guests. Um, here we have, and am I saying it right, Cal? Cal, usually. But Cal. You can say however you want. I'm remarkably <laughs> indifferent. Thank you, and we're welcome to the live stream today here on the Glass Table Live. And then we have Andrea. Hi. And Mary Byler. Hi. Hi. The, so as you can tell, that our taglines are a little different today. You can kind of see what uh, all of our ex-religious are. And for some reason, I don't know why I flipped mine back. I have to flip mine <laughs> <laughs> at another time. Um, so let's see who we got in the comments. Yes, Susan says to, she does hear an echo. Oh. So what I'm going to do is, why don't we go around the glass table and, te and tell all of our viewers, you're probably familiar with, you know, Emma and Molly and I, but for those who may see this live stream and another, you know, venue or another group or something, and you don't know us, we're going to go around the glass table and talk about, uh, the religion we came from and why we left, right? So like, what well, we'll go ahead and start with Emma, and we'll come back around to me, and I'm gonna work on some audio issues in the back. Okay. Well, um, basically, my granddad was the original Jehovah's Witness in our family, so my mum was kind of brought up in it. Um, she left at 16. She had me, my brother, and my sister, and then she decided to go back to the religion when she was 24 and got baptized, and um, married an elder guy. So then I was brought up in it. Um, when I got to about age 18, 19, I started leading a double life. I didn't like the rules. I wanted freedom. I wanted to go out and do what I wanted. I was always in trouble for the way I dressed, people I was hanging around with. So when it got to, I got to about age 21, I was like, I can't do this anymore. I don't want to go to the meetings anymore. Um, my parents told me I needed to move out so I wouldn't um, influence my brother and sister. So I ended up moving out within four weeks and I tried to fade away. I had the elders camping outside my house on the doorstep, chasing me up the road. We need to speak to you, we need to speak to you. Um, I refused to speak to them and then eventually I got called into a judicial because I got grassed down for having sex. And they said, if I didn't go to the judicial, then my mum and stepdad would have to go in my place. I didn't want to put them through that. So I decided to go, there's like, are you repentant? No, you're going to do it again? Yes, I will have to disfellowship you then. So that was like nearly, oh, 24 years this month. So I was like, see you later. And I knew that once I left, I was never going back. So that's my story. Who's next, Molly? You're next on the... Uh, I, I guess. <laughs> So, uh, as you can see, uh, I am also an XAW, -X and uh, my story is a bit different because I wasn't born in, but I was indoctrinated at five, and then I was indoctrinated 
alone from my family. So my blood family was like worldly people, as JWs would call it. They had nothing to do with the religion at all. It was just me from age five up to like uh, 15, 16 ish. And uh, I left because my mom uh, followed me and caught me doing Jehovah's Witness stuff. And she locked me in our house. And, I, you know, uh, I was alone. I had brain cells that started working. And those brain cells came to the conclusion that it's bullshit. Uh, other than the realization that it was very, like, abusive and repressive for me to be there. For uh, various reasons, like, mainly as, you know... A, female human being and then uh, secondly because I'm asexual and Jehovah's Witnesses really push the idea on you that you should like get married and pop the kids out one after the other uh, even though they don't really ban contraception and all that but uh, they really encourage to have kids as I guess Emma and Spencer can attest to that like they really encourage you get married at 18 or as soon as you can and then just pop out the kids increase the numbers and get some good JW kids in, in the system. So being, you know, away from it just did its magic. And I have been out since then, which is uh, nine years this year around my birthday. Cool. So Carol, you're next on the uh, agenda. Yeah, I, sorry, I was muted. So, um, yeah, I was uh, born into the LDS church. Uh, my grandfather was a member of just a whole bunch of different religions growing up. He was in just a whole bunch of them. And he kind of settled in when he, um, around when he married my grandmother. And then just by nature of him being in it, you know, he raised the, everyone else in the family into the, the religion. And uh, it's kind of stuck with it. He keeps insisting that he's not that into it, but, you know, he's pretty into it. Um, I left the church when I was about 14 years old. Uh, just, I'm going to be honest, I never put too much thought into why I started to leave, but I think it comes down to just, I really started thinking about it. And certain things like the fact that every religion out there namely Abrahamic religions, but most of the religions always say, you know, hey, I'm the correct religion, your religion is false. And I figured, hey, you know, that can't be true for all of them. And then uh, I just started to think about it more and more and just how kind of subtly repressive the religion is and, you know, uh, started thinking about just, it wasn't for me. And so I just stopped going to, to church and as things happened, people weren't too happy about it. Um, my family wasn't especially happy about it, but they kind of just let me do my thing. Probably thought I was just going through a phase. I don't know. Couldn't tell you. But as things happened, I just, I finally got out. All right, Mary, did you want to go next? I think you're on mute. Yep. Okay. Hi, I'm Mary. I was born into an Amish family and I read the Bible multiple times and then I had questions and they told me that like I'm reading the Bible too much and you shouldn't be questioning that and because I can't possibly comprehend what's actually being meant by that because I'm a woman. And then when I, I didn't have an opportunity to actually leave until I was 19 and it had gotten to a point where I believe my sister was being abused sexually and she was six years old and at that point I had the resources to leave and I left and I reported the abuse and her abuser went to prison it was a fact um, my family and my community shunned me and that's kind of my story all right and Andrea, am I saying your name right? I'm saying Andrea. 
that's how I pronounce it, but I don't okay. really care how people pronounce okay. it. So. I just want to make sure I got your name right. It's not a thing. <laughs> um, so I was born and raised right in like the heart of the the Mormon world or, you know, ish, not, not, because Salt Lake, wow, that's where the Mormon uh, headquarters are. It's, it's like half-ish actual, actually Mormons in the population at this point. Um, but it was like 90% Mormon where I grew up in little Spanish Fork, Utah, the whole Provo, Orem, that kind of area. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, long, long line of, of Mormons. And I, I actually grew up loving being a Mormon. And it wasn't until, um, gosh, my 30s, but like mid 30s, that I started to go, you know, there are some things that I deeply disagree with. Um, I just don't believe God could could work that way. Um, <clears throat> and I had had lived my entire life spending lots of time with people who are not not members and talking about different religions and all those things. So my walk away story was when um, some sexual abuse stories came out that that really did prove quite well that it wasn't just within um, you know local it wasn't a problem just within local but that there were one um, and and many um, instances where even the prophet general authorities you know literally the very highest parts of the church that were not only hiding the abuse but they were enabling the abuse and hiding away the victims while continuing to promote the perpetrators. And I just, that was, that was it. Nope. I, I'm not touching that. You know, you don't get my name. You don't get my, my support. And, and I was out. And so uh, really come, and, and I had already kind of seen and gotten to realize that there were a few culty aspects. Um, but yeah, a lot of that wasn't realized until after I had left. Spencer, you're muted. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you so much, you guys, for sharing all of your stories. I was just going to say that um, if you guys are just joining us, we have two ex-Mormons on the panel, uh, ex-Amish, and three ex-Jehovah Witness, uh, Witnesses that are on the panel today. And this live stream, we are talking about cults versus cults. Um and if you're just joining us, we're going to, in a moment, define what is a cult, because a lot of people use that uh, term freely in talking in connection with religion. And that's not always the case uh, that everything is or every religion is a cult. Uh, then we're going to go around uh, Well, we're doing that right now, going around the glass table to share our own stories of the cult and what made us leave. And then we're going to lead off with some rapid fire questions about the cults that we were in. And we're going to take questions and comments from you guys. So if you guys have any questions for anybody on the panel or about the religions that are being featured today, go ahead and shoot. You have uh, what six experts <laughs> uh, form of former members from of the religion. Um, for me, it, there, there was not one thing that made me leave the Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, it was a, a accumulation of things, um, but like Andrea, our religion became forefront in the news with the sexual abuse. And I think uh, if you followed our streams, I've been open about the sexual abuse that I endured, uh, although it was unreported. And we've been very open about our own stories here on the glass table. But when those abuse stories start hit hitting the uh, papers and I didn't see, and I was observing how the religion was handling these cases, almost hiding them. Um, you know, I didn't realize that they were settling some of these cases and we just listen to a, a stories of other survivors. It started to bother me, but that wasn't enough to make me leave. It was also some doctrinal issues that I had uh, that a pioneer um, I think you, uh, Mormons call them missionaries. They kind of like missionaries, but pioneers 
a friend of mine start questioning the doctrine and then the rest was history because I was actually going to try to help her on the site, you know, to try to get her to not apostatize and I end up apostatizing. And, um, so that would be my reason. There were, I, like I said, it wasn't just one, one thing. It was so many things. It was the no blood doctrine. Uh, it was the, um, shunning that I endured after I started to change my mind and was kicked out of the religion. Uh, and then their policies on sex abuse. We're all familiar with the two witness rule that we are all fighting against with that is unique to the Jehovah's Witnesses. And if you guys are joining our stream or don't are not really aware of what that is, uh, Jehovah Witnesses require two witnesses to child sex abuse before uh, they were reporting the abuse and in some case not reporting at all. So um, that's a little bit, I guess, a little bit of background about us on the panel. Like, why don't we go ahead and get into some other things, like some questions? Yay! Um, who wants to start? Crazy stories from your ex. Uh, Cal, didn't you say you had one a crazy story for me? What were we talking about? So I I believe that I was going to tell you just about some strange practices that happen in the church. Okay, that um, works. One of the bigger ones, and I I was um, asked on. I believe by Emma actually because of certain questions that youth get asked when they get temple recommends. But um, something that I figured I'd mention here is uh, a practice in the LDS church of what we, or what we, what they call uh, baptisms for the dead. And it's just as strange as it sounds. So inside the temple, and this is the only part of the temple where people who are not full of age members are allowed is this, almost like a basement in this basement is a large tub that sits on the back of, I think it's 12 ox like statues of oxen. And what goes on there is that the church has a list of, I guess just every human being who is not a member. I don't entirely know where they get that list from Andrea. Maybe you could pitch in there. I have no idea, but uh, what happens is you go in there as a, 12 year old sometimes and you're expected to be baptized again for people who are dead so that they can get into heaven wow like regardless whether or not that they were baptized in life regardless whether or not they knew the church existed in life you were expected to do a baptism for them to get them into heaven okay you know what council i think i remember reading something in a newspaper where People, I guess, of people that were being baptized, like their dead loved ones, they didn't even have permission when the church was baptizing certain. Is that true? Like baptizing certain their family members and they didn't have permission to do it? Like so they were going I, as far back as um, like some well known famous figures. So that wouldn't surprise me in the least. But um, as far as I know, I think the only two reasons you wouldn't get a baptism done for you is if it was like specifically asked not to happen via like, I think an immediate family member or uh, I think Jews, I think Jews weren't allowed to get baptisms for the dead. Andrea, I don't know if you could pitch in with that, but I, I think I remember that. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. Um, so early on the, because the church really just wanted it done, you know, for everybody and anybody. And so, so they really didn't have any rules. There's a way that you, uh, the way they get the names is not, Every person, you, you have to do a lot of research and, and you have to um, show like date of birth, date of death. It, there, there's a few things and stuff that you have to do to submit names. Um, but there are people that like that's basically their job to do. And a lot of members will spend, especially at home moms, they'll spend hours every day um, working on the ancestry lines uh, to submit names. Uh, for, for the, the work for the dead. And, and it's not just baptisms, it's their um, eternal marriages. Mm -hmm. it, it's just all of their, um, their temple work, really, just all those ceremonies. Um, anyway, but then the church got some really heavy, uh, you know, criticism for the work that was being done, especially because they found out that 
Um, some famous people like JFK, uh, you know, JFK Jr., um, uh, Disney, Walt Disney. Uh, anyway, right. and, and not only had their, was their work done without anyone's, you know, permission or anything like that, um, but it was done multiple times. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, um, but also the Jews, the, hol- the, the uh, victims of the Holocaust, quite a few people had, had taken upon themselves and felt like this was their mission of love to do this. And, and I understand, I mean, within, within the Mormon doctrines and, and understanding, it is genuinely a loving thing that they are doing and offering. And the, the understanding within the church is that the work is not done. And then that means they absolutely are baptized and part of the church, blah, blah, blah. It's, simply done as an opportunity for them to accept, um, you know, in death for their spirit to accept. But, you know, totally understandably, people got really, really upset with that. And we're like, look, you know, we're not okay with this. We don't know about your religion. All we know is that they were not your, your religion and this isn't okay for you to just do that. So now there are some pretty clear rules about all those things. Anytime you go in to, um, the, the website where you can can submit that it has all of the rules about what they can do. That does not mean that people don't break those rules because people do. Uh, and and there may even be, you know, breaking rules breaking that, that is known, uh, you know, anything like that. But the actual official rules are that they cannot do it. Um, you can't do any uh, work for the dead if they have a living relative within one or two generations of them, things like, so they have to be someone who was fairly long dead. They have to, you know, unless if they're recently dead, they have a family member who is a member of the church that wants to do it for them and 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 they give the permission. That's kind of, that's kind of upsetting when you think about it because they're doing it only to the long dead because then no one alive can bitch about it. But, um, you know, it's, Something that you mentioned is talking about, um, especially single mothers, which there's a lot of in the LDS church, especially here in Utah. But a lot of the the people in the church, the LDS church focuses very heavily on genealogy and ancestry. And almost every Mormon I've ever met, you know, they have, I'm looking at in my room right now, it's something my grandfather commissioned from the church where they'll search through your entire history of your family and go back your family line, however many generations just to have, you know, it's, they focus really, really heavily on that, you know, genealogy stuff. And even down by the temple in my town, they have a whole building that's just singularly dedicated to that scouring records and tracing back everyone's genealogy. And a lot of that goes to the baptisms of the dead, but you know, and, and one of the things that you don't think about as a young Mormon is cults but when you start to because it's just a normal church it sucks you go three hours on a sunday you know it takes away from time you could be doing literally anything else and then while you're there you're not thinking about it your church has a basketball court in it that's kind of cool but then when you go to the temple and you're in a room that's entirely painted white and everything's made out of marble and there's 12 statues of an ox with a giant bathtub on top of it and then you have to stand in there with an old man and he grabs your arm and says, do you, John Smith, accept this baptism? And then you get dunked underwater. Yeah, it's kind of weird when you think about it. When you, when, you, when you start to use your noggin, that's a little peculiar. You know what? It's not until you leave that you start to, it starts yeah. to set in that, wow, I can't believe we did that. Or we used to do that. Well, even uh, when I was in, and I was pretty devout at the time. I mean, I lied directly to my bishop's face when I got my temple recommend, but like even then, I was still pretty into the church. But e- even then, I remember thinking, this is really strange. I don't want to yeah. shower next to grown ass men. <laughs> well, as, as well, like, I asked you about it, Cal, because um, I learned through um, Sam Young about that they'll ask like kids sexual questions when they're 12 or 13 to make sure that they qualify to go to the temple. And, and that's why he. He objected to that and then that's when his problem started and then obviously i'm not sure whether he got excommunicated but he, he ended up leaving 
Ava Hayes' young daughters being sexually questioned when they were that age. Mm -hmm. I want to get Mary in here. Mary, do you have any unique practices, strange teachings that are unique to the Amish? Experiences? Oh, Is it a lot? Uh, <laughs> where, where would you like me to start? I mean, do you I, want me I don't to talk know. about the strange courtship rituals? Do you want me to talk about well, the fact that about a month before I became nonconforming, my mom told me that if you get married, you have to do everything that your husband wants to and obey him and everything. And it, that includes sexually. Like, basically, you have no rights. You have no body autonomy, nothing. Or, oh, wow. like... The fact of like that my egg donor, my bio mom also believed that I was sexually assaulted as a child because I didn't pray hard enough or because I didn't really believe or whatever it was like just and let's not talk about the clothes or the fact that like when Carl was talking about having these big statues or oxen like we were not allowed to have any of that because that is a graven image and that would be considered a sin. Like you know, just you mentioned weird we, stuff. I, we or, talked briefly before the streaming. You mentioned something about uh, how the practice of is it incest or um, is common? It's not incest. It's inbreeding. It's in inbreeding. Thank you. Inbreeding. Oh, the fact of like the whole, so the Amish people came here from Europe. And by the way, like you can trace my ancestry all the way back to like who actually came over here in a boat. They have books that are devoted to genealogy like that. Um, but there's so, there has been no introduction of new blood. And because of that, they are so inbred that they have like their own genetic defects that happen and it's a metabolic disorder. Um, they view that as this is the will of God instead of like thinking of it from like a scientific perspective. And by the way, there's multiple different Amish communities now, for it, viewers. Just so you know, like I w lived in five different right. communities. Some Amish may practice differently, but I speak on behalf of those five communities. And I think Cal and Andrea, you were saying briefly that FLDS is different from LDS, and I think that's probably an important distinction for our audience. Y yeah. So you have Andrew. You looked like you wanted to talk, pitch in. Would you like to take this one? Sure. Um, yeah, the FLDS religion, and it um, technically there's really quite a few. I mean, there's quite a few offshoots from the the LDS religion in in general that became their own religions, but then FLDS um, even has kind of their own uh, groups that have broken off and stuff from, from fighting over, you know, doctrinal bits and stuff. But there are some really, really fundamental differences. Um, they, they practice polygamy uh, because they practice polygamy and because it's so many, um, you know, they're, they're, they have multiple wives, but, <laughs> That, what do you do with the young men? So they'll excommunicate and and kick out the young men in droves, and um, and, and do whatever they can to keep. Well, I mean, not exactly whatever, but they're just they're they're highly highly abusive. It it's an extreme like so the LDS religion is a fairly high control group. You know, we, we have three hours of church on Sunday. We have young, uh, activities throughout the week for different age groups to, to attend. You know, so you're, you're pretty involved. But within the FLDS, it's your entire life. It's your entire community. The police officers in the town that you live in, what, even if they're not actually members, they're um, in cahoots with the leadership. Um, so you can't go to them to get help. Um, they, the, their school is not, it's a private school. It's almost all just religious indoctrination. They, they do not teach science. They do not teach history. They do not teach, um, you know, the, the things that to us would be considered fundamental. 
whereas within the the general Mormon LDS church, almost everybody goes to public school. Um, the, even the the schools in Utah teach the the theory of evolution. That's not something that that Mormons freak out about being taught. You know, so there are some you pretty big that. differences. So I have a no, question. I'm, about I'm just talking about the the actual like state laws and how that's done. There are lots of members that have issues with it. So and I mean yeah, and that is true. I live. Um, I'm not sure where you live, but I live in an area that's in pretty close proximity to um, Colorado City, which is where a large amount of Warren Jeffs FLDS. And I should say because I don't think we have yet um, the LDS church stands for Latter-day Saints, the Church of Latter-day Saints. And then you have the FLDS, which are the fundamental Latter-day Saints. And they are just a far more extreme. And it's like Andrea said, they live in entire communities that are 100% their compounds, basically. When you think of Scientology and their, you know, weird compounds and stuff, it's that to a citywide scale. And you don't have, you know, anything that isn't. And Sometimes, you know, I used to work at the Walmart in my town and we would get FLDS or yeah, FLDS coming through all the time. And they're the ones that you'll see. They, they all have, they have a uniform that they wear every day that everyone always wears the long underwear. The women always wear like plain style dresses that they are, I believe, made to sew themselves from a very young age. They all wear their hair in a certain way. The men have to wear long sleeve shirts even in St. George, Utah, where it's, you know, 45 degrees Celsius for nine months out of the year, they have to wear the long underwear and jeans. And it's just, you see that from the youngest kid all the way up to, you know, the grandmothers that come through. And like Mary said, with the inbreeding in Amish communities, there's so few people that are coming into FLDS communities that when they come through, you can just see on them that they are remarkably inbred. And you, you wow. even if you don't know what to look for, you could tell that these people, there's just genetic things wrong with them you know and it, it is kind of sad to see but it's not just yeah. it's not just that they grow up in communities entirely consisting of flds but they are nigh on forbidden from even speaking to anyone who is not part of the flds so you know i me working at a walmart a while back i'd say you know hey welcome to walmart and they just eyes straight ahead they literally cannot look at you and um like Andrea said, the we don't, we all go, do go to public schools, but when you're in an area like where I live, all the public schools, every single member of staff is, you know, LDS. So yeah. even your teachers are going to say, hey, here's the theory of evolution, but, you know, it may not be right. Wink, wink. And they kind of force that in everything. I had a, I had a geography yeah, but- teacher or a humanities teacher in middle school who would... Uh, you know, it's humanities. You have to learn about other cultures and religions. And he'd get up there and he'd say, yeah, today we're going to talk about Hinduism. It's uh, one of the biggest religions. It's not the correct religion. My religion's the correct religion. Anyways, here's Hinduism. And he would do that every single time with every single different culture or religion. So, you know. Yeah, but that's an area where there's a there's a pretty big spectrum of what people believe. Because I, I can't tell you how many people I know who believe that evolution is the way God made all this happen yeah i've heard that one you know so yeah like it's a whole spectrum and but it is true that because so many of the teachers are are also lds a lot of lds stuff gets slipped in all throughout school it's kind of a really subtle way that they keep you indoctrinated really because they just kind of you know subtly push these people into becoming teachers and then you know the cycle of you know, indoctrination continues. Mary, you had a question for the Mormon. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) So going back to like talking about your education. So in 1971, there was a case where um, the state of Wisconsin had filed a case trying to force um, a Yoder Amish family to force their kids to attend compulsory education to high school. And what had happened is the right wing, Christianity movement went in and paid for attorneys. And then I forget the man's name, but um, some guy who was supposed to be an expert on the Amish came in and testified and the Amish family actually won that ruling. And when that happened, like 
what it did is it created this thing where Amish kids don't have to go to public school. They have their own schools. They have their own school books. The things that are published, it's kind of like what you guys were describing, where it's like it's very indoctrination like and all of that. Like I only went to eighth grade until I became nonconforming. And then they had their own books that were published by their own publishers. They had their own teachers that also only had an eighth grade education. And they were generally like just somebody who had just went to school and finished their eighth grade and then became a teacher because the church needed a teacher. And it wasn't necessarily that the teacher actually knew how to do the work in the workbook. Like we had teachers who would literally say like similar things to what you were saying is like, oh, hey, here's this or whatever, but not really because we didn't learn any science. We didn't learn any health. We didn't learn anything about um, most of the history. It was very, like we, very minimal, I guess you could say. Yeah. So well, you is know, that, that something? Oh, oh, no, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. Uh, do, do you think that like some of that was influenced by that decision? Because that it was kind of like the general society putting it out there is like in the footnotes of that ruling, they had written that the Amish people do not commit crimes. And so it kind of like created a situation where general society looks at the Amish like they're on this pedestal and they can do no wrong. Do you think that affects the Mormon church as well? Um. Well, I can't speak to that, like, for sure. Um, what I can say is, uh, one, the, the, you know, like I said before, the way the FLDS church handles it is very, very different. The, the laws in Utah and, um, and the, the majority of the FLDS is actually, like, just barely over the border into Colorado. Um, but the law in Utah is you can homeschool by... And all you have to do is once your child is of age, you state that um, they're going to be getting X amount of time uh, being educated and like that's it. And, you, and that you, you find that they're being homeschooled. So how you do it, what, what, the, uh, you know, what they're taught is not in any way checked on or, or anything like that. Um, in Idaho, in, in um you know, it's even more lax in California. It's, it's, you know, so, so the state laws have a lot to do with, with some of that stuff, but within the Mormon, the regular, like the main uh, LDS church, they're actually really, um, they, they hugely encourage education. So it's actually really uncommon for LDS kids not not just to go to public school and get the regular public schooling education that that um standardized now pretty much nationally um but they it's really rare for them to not go on to college speaking Even of college and higher school, education yeah. i think that's a really good topic for us to all talk on because yeah. that's one of the things I admire about your cult <laughs> your ex cult yeah. or whatever was the, was because in the ex Jehovah witness cult um and we're going to actually go it's now that we have tyler thank you for joining us we're going to actually go into uh talking about what we mean by cult uh but in in a minute but we we were discouraged from higher education and not only were we Same. discouraged from higher education uh, um i remember me personally having to drop feeling guilted into dropping out of college because i was setting a bad example you know, because the leaders or the elders felt that I was uh, do, giving a bad example for other young people in my um, uh, congregation, although I was pioneering, which is equivalent, I guess, to the missionary work that you guys do in the Mormons. Um, but uh, still, it was a problem. So, I mean... That's one big difference between I've noticed between the Mormon religion and the Jehovah Witness religion is their ideas on education. And there are there were a lot of Jehovah Witnesses uh, in my community who homeschooled as well. Um, and a lot of you'll find uh, ex Jehovah Witnesses, a lot of them come from homeschool families. Now, they didn't uh, have like a curriculum per se from the Jehovah's Witnesses. But I know a lot of Jehovah Witness parents who would incorporate uh 
the watchtowers and you know literature from the uh religion in the curriculum for school so i mean it's science math you can almost forget about being you know on the same wavelength as everybody else who's actually in school because they are focused not only on doctrine um outside of schooling but they've incorporated in the schooling curriculum for the children so anyway tyler thank you for joining us um can you hear me. can you hear us really well yeah okay yeah, can you guys and, hear me? yeah i just want to make sure because we are having some sound issues today y'all so um we are going to go into definition of, we probably should have did this kind of kick it off but we had some sound issues before to talk about what we mean exactly by cult you know some people be believe that just because a religion's or that's religion in itself is a cult um but steve hassan actually has a bite model is there anybody on our panel I, I think everybody on our panel is probably familiar with that uh i'm going to actually flash it across the screen here what makes so because somebody maybe i don't know talking their own words uh, what what you what what makes our cult? Why are we calling our particular religions cults? I'm mean, uh, as opposed to just religion. What makes it different? I, I think for me, if I had to start just to start it off, is I remember looking at a meme saying that to to tell how you can tell whether or not your religion is a cult or not is based on what happens after you leave and how they treat you. And we have a, a, a few extra hope witnesses on the panel. We are very familiar with the shunning and excommunication practices that uh, Jehovah Witnesses uh, practice. So, um, yeah. If, if I may, just real quick. Yeah, go ahead, Just Kel. one sentence here. Or, so there's a comedian by the name of Joe Rogan, who you may or may not have heard of. Yeah. But he has a bit on one of his comedy specials where he says, the difference between a cult and a religion is you have one guy who's completely insane and they believe something remarkably out there and in a religion that guy's dead so right that, that was his definition but all right sorry i just wanted to pitch in with that thanks Joe thank Rogan. you Ka okay. casey allen for joining us from twitter and periscope uh, we just started streaming to periscope last week uh is christianity a cult that's one of the reasons why i wanted to bring out the bite model because um, a lot of people will say that Christianity or maybe the uh, Islam and though that they, they're a cult. But if you notice that the uh, bite model that uh, Steve Hassan uses, he talks about behavior control, uh, information control, thought control, emotional control. And he actually lists uh, some things under there. Like, for instance, for behavior control, he talks about how religions if your religion promotes dependence and you know obedience or acts that you modify your behavior with rewards and punishments uh whether uh they he has listed here if they, if they exploit you financially or they restrict your leisure time and activities i think a lot of us could probably attest to that here as ex-mormons maybe ex amish and ex Jehovah witnesses um especially if you were born in do you guys call it born in as well i know Jehovah's witnesses say it. we say it like I yeah, born it. into raised into raised into yeah born into is a common officially it's called born under the covenant or within the cup in the covenant okay well covenant I mean, I'm I'm a there's Amish <laughs> people do have one fundamental difference is and where they do not recruit there's very few people that will actually go attempt to join an Amish church and generally they are never ever fully received into the fold because they were not born into it but yes I call it born Amish and I call myself more non-conforming because I don't conform to their ideology but there are things that carried on over that are still present today. Like we lived in a lot of fear. Um, there was always the fear of the devil, the fear of going to hell, the fear of like, you're going to burn forever and ever and ever. And there's going to be the great reckoning, the microchip fear, stuff like that. I think David in the comments is actually, I'm sorry, it's kind of covering up the screen here, but he said, he I call it fogs, fear mongering, obligation, burden, 
Guilt tripping, shame blaming, ex-Scientologist Mike Reinder stated it well by saying that the difference between a religion or a faith or a belief versus the, a fine cult is how they treat, treat you if you decide to leave. Because, you know, in preparing for our stream, we had a various uh, Christian denominations, um, well, one Christian denomination who uh, a person felt like it was a cult. Um, you have to really understand what we mean by we, what we say cult. You know, it's not that, you know, with Christian denominations, for instance, where the, the person gave an example of a Pentecostal uh, denomination being a cult. There may be some markers that you, uh, within Christianity that they have to define each other as cults. But when we're talking about under the big umbrella here of what of cults, um, I think if you want to do some good research, I think Steve Hassan has some great books. Um, also, yeah. I think Leah Remini did a special. Go ahead, Tyler. Yeah. Were you trying to jump in here? Yeah, well, it just related to what you were saying, especially with yeah. uh, the light model and Steve Hassan. And if we're, it, it tied in right from when you went into higher education into defining a cult by the bite model. Yeah, I was looked down upon as I went back to get some higher education through the congreg from the congregation. Um, and it was, uh, honestly, I got a lot of, uh, it, it was some, I wouldn't say opposition, but had a lot of people really look down on me because why would I waste time trying to better myself and, you know, things now when I should just be looking, you know, to the future. And so, but when you, it kind of feeds into like you're talking with the bite model and when you have it up there on the screen, it's funny, like I've talked with different people and honestly of the entire list of traits within that bite model, the only ones that I've seen that don't systematically <laughs> at least apply to witnesses is and in some of the amended ones related to rape and torture and beating and murder and systematically depriving people of sleep aside from that almost everything on that list you can go down check 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 so it's it's very culty in the way it in the way it operates but i just wanted to add one brief thing and then jump back off but when you talk about Steve Hassan, I was actually really surprised to find out that he's actually religious. Even after he escaped from the Moonies and he's actually a religious person now, he belongs to a Jewish synagogue. So the point that he makes though is not all beliefs in that way are necessarily harmful and that's where you have to make the differentiation. Things like hypnosis, that's a form of mind control. But if you utilize that to help someone stop smoking, lose weight, things like that. It's not always negative, so it really has to be balanced. But anyway, that's my take on the white model there. And Andrea, you want to speak to the spectrum and of religion? I, 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 to the person who asks, is Christianity a cult? I just want to say, in a nutshell, I would say no, uh, and I would say personally no because for a few reasons, it doesn't meet the bite model. And also, you have some, I would say that there are some denominations within Christianity that may meet the criteria of being a high control group, but not necessarily a cult. Go ahead, Andrea. You, you said there's a spectrum. Yeah, yeah. It's really interesting. If you take the bite model and, and the, the strictest understanding and, and definition that he uses, every religion has aspects that fit a cult but it's it, it really is a, a quite large spectrum um and re a lot in fact some people talk about how religions are basically cults that survived the like high cult period into something that that <laughs> could survive multiple generations and then during those multiple generations in order to stick around, they have to start making some confessions and, and things like that. Um, but there really is like a huge spectrum. Um, even just within the, the Mormon church, like my experience and, and the way that I was taught was deeply different, even though um, it was such a long um, ancestral, you know, many, many generations of being Mormons, it was deeply different from the, the majority of people around me. I have a friend who, um, whose brother was kicked out of the house because he didn't want to keep his hair cut missionary length. 
and style and had to go live for a whole summer with his aunt and uncle until he agreed that he was going to conform and, and follow all the rules. But for me, um, I come from a family as there's four of us, four kids, and three of the four have left the church. We still have really deep, close ties with my mom. Uh, my father's bipolar, so um, totally different reasons that, that we are not um, close to him. But like that was never an issue. Us leaving was never an issue. Um, I was, I had friends that were not, not members and that was awesome. And if I wanted to go to church with them, that was awesome. Like my, my parents really um, encouraged that even because they felt like the more you learn, the, the better um, equipped you are to, to be a better member. Um, you know, so, and, and really all religions end up having that spectrum. And then it's, and then you're going to have people within each of those that get extra culty, even if they're not within a group that's doing it. Like we have some Mormon groups that have gone way off the deep end. They believe in zombies. They, and, and like serious stuff, but they're still members. They're, they're, they're still a part of it. And then we have people that just within their own, like there was a, a movie years and years ago, back when I was a teenager, called Steel Magnolias. And this, the cute uh, hairdresser joins some evangelical religion and ne suddenly can't stop praying, has to pray over every little thing, you know? So she was handling it regardless of what the, the leaders were doing it as a, as a high control, high cult um, group. And, and it's just kind of interesting because, you know, within every ward, like, uh, with it, you know what I mean? So there really is a spectrum. And I think we need to acknowledge that uh, how each person's experience is going to be somewhere on that spectrum of just how controlling it was. But there's some of it in every religion because there's always some limit to where, you know, and suggestions of where you should and shouldn't get your information from, of who you should and shouldn't, should and should not be spending your time with, of how you should be handling your emotions, what emotions are good or, or bad. Like there's some of that in every single religion. It's just, is it this much or is it like controlling your whole life? Right. In, in, in extreme cults and beliefs. And so what we're going to do um, in order to, so that our audience can get an idea of what our cult, uh, former cult kind of thought about some issues and things. We're going to go over some rapid fire questions. I thought it would kind of be cool that we kind of just answered them. Um, I mean, we have like what four extra hope witnesses on the panel. So we'll kind of switch off a little bit. Tyler, did you want to jump in here before we do that? I thought it looked like you wanted to say something or no. Just, just a little bit of my point, like Andrea was saying, okay, well, yes. there's obviously there's a scale there and it was just related to is something destructive or not. If it's a destructive cult, that's a problem, but that's just the only thing. Right. Okay. Okay. So now the our uh, next question, I guess, the, one of the questions that we have was, "What was your cult's view on the LGBTQ uh, community?" I think, uh, or right their rights, if any. Um, I guess most of our the cults that were being featured here are fundamentalist cults. So homosexuality is just like a huge no no. I would say, well, uh, but. When it comes to the, the LDS church, I can actually pitch in here a little bit. Go ahead. So um, while it is still considered sinful to be LGBT in any way, um, lately the church has kind of laxed up just a little bit, um, probably because they got a, in a lot of big trouble re, uh, a couple years back for um, explicitly stating that if two lesbians or homosexual males had uh, adopted a child, that child would not be allowed to seek the church they wouldn't be allowed to come into the church even regardless whether or not they themselves are lgbt in any way because their parents or adopted parents are homosexuals they would not be allowed to to join and they got a lot of flack for that so i think recently they've kind of adjusted it a bit and as it is recently when i was reading up doing some research for this show um they are now kind of falling back on that a bit so lgbt members can still be members 
but they're kind of not really allowed in the temple. And there's just some, you know, some little things that they, they aren't exactly afforded as members. Um, and they, they did say uh, specifically on their website, I believe I read that they kind of encourage LGBT members to speak to their local bishops or, you know, presidencies or whatever to kind of discuss the best way to go around it because they do believe they're in the kind of this weird state where they do believe that homosexuality and specifically homosexual sin is, uh, or homosexual love is a sin. They do believe that a it's a married couple's, you know, duty to, to have sex and B to, you know, show up and, and, you know, be members and, and to love one another. So they're kind of in this weird area where they just can't quite figure out what they think. So, you know, it's, it's a very recent thing that they've kind of started to back off just a little bit, but they are still, you know, if you have homos, like the, the, I think the, the current belief, as I understand it is they're not a huge fan of you being in a homosexual relationship, but if you don't consummate it, quote unquote, then they're kind of more okay with it than if you don't. I don't know. They're in a strange spot with with homosexuality and the LGBTQ community and as a whole. Andrea, did you have any comments on that? As, as far as the official Sorry, I just had to unmute myself. Yeah, so the official position of the of the LDS church is kind of funny just because you have scripture, then you have um, canonized doctrine, mm -hmm. and technically that has to um, be unanimously agreed on a, by um, the, the leadership of the church, but also voted on by the body of the church, um, because that's the rules back from when Joseph Smith started it. And so we haven't had anything canonized in a really long time. Um, but the the official position that, that they've uh, put out there is that it, there is no sin in being LGBTQ, but there is sin on acting on certain things. Yeah. And they, they intentionally keep that vague, which I think is shitty to be, you know, perfectly frank. Um, because it means that bishops can go, oh, so, you know, he's got this boyfriend and stuff, but I feel like they're, you know, being good, and blah, 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 you know, whatever, as long as they're not having sex of whatever, but then they're fine. And they can have pretty, pretty full standing, um, might even be able to, to go to the temple. Um, it, it just, you know, as long as they're not like living together or whatever. Um, whereas you'll have another leader, another bishop, who says, "No, if you if you do anything that I even suspect that you're you're you know even going on a date or you whatever, then you can't do anything. You can't you know. So so they they I I personally believe that they purposely leave it um, fairly vague. But the the official position is um, it's not a sin to be. To to, ha to to be that way or f have those feelings, you just can't actually act on it um, in any significant way. Mm -hmm. um, you um, your your children cannot be baptized without express permission. So if you're if you have if you are LGBTQ and you have children who want to be baptized, um, there's a whole thing you have to go through, and you may or may not get permission. Um, but it is possible. Um, I'm trying to think what else, and, but, but outside of that, there's, there are people, uh, within the church that of course, you know, completely advocate for the LGBTQ community and want all of these things changed. And at the same time, my brother who's gay was teaching at math in, in Salt Lake city area. And he was being so terribly harassed by some students, one in particular, that he kept bringing it up with the, the you know, school administration and, and the district administration, and they would not do a single thing because regardless of the official position, there's still a lot of very anti-LGBTQ, um, you know, thoughts, beliefs and stuff around all of that. 
I would have to say that even with that, that is more progressive than the Jehovah's Witnesses. Because yeah. Yeah. The, they're, when you say Tyler and um, Molly and X, um, well, I was well, I don't want to call you X, J, J, W, Emma. <laughs> um, the, you can't, not only do they not acknowledge that you have homosexual feelings, if you have that, you can, that doesn't, I mean, they, you're not, that's sinning right then and there. I mean, it's not that, wouldn't you say, Molly? Go ahead. I mean, I mean it's not like you can I have mean, the thoughts and still serve. Like, if like, they knew that you were gay or practicing, I know, like, with my friend, you know, he couldn't have privileges within the uh, congregation because they felt like he nice. was still practicing and stuff like that. Not just that, but in my experience, and I, uh, I, I think maybe my experience will be the most up-to-date because I, I grew up. Uh, like in the 2000s, so that they're like teachings for young people kind of stuff is like quite fresh in my memory, unfortunately. Uh, but basically the teaching was that just no, like no gay thoughts, no gay ac actions, n nothing gay. Uh, like unless you like purposefully decide that you will like forget about it basically. but that's what i was saying about jehovah witnesses versus mormons um whether you are a jehovah's witnesses a jehovah witness in the 2000 1990s or 1950s the jehovah witnesses have not changed their stance on how they feel about homosexuality that i mean yeah. whereas mormons seem to be a little bit progressive they have you know a, a vague you know, stand in the, and then they also allow them to have privileges. Kids get baptized. They almost acknowledge their uh, uh, that they're LGBTQ or even advocate for them. You would never find advocacy for LGBTQ within the Jehovah's Witness. Emma, Emma, no, you, no. you about to say something? Yeah, I think like um, a lot of the times though with witnesses, it varies comparing what area you're from because. I remember being told I left in 96 and I was under the impression that you can be um, gay as long as you don't act on it and then that's when it becomes a problem and we went on holiday and the congregation there actually had um, a trans guy and I remember he, he, he answered up at the watchtower and my stepdad who's an elder nearly fell off his chair because he's just like what? Like, how, how can that happen? And then he spoke to the elders after, and they said, well, he's studying. Um, he's not in a relationship with anybody, so at the moment, he's allowed to answer up. But if he wants to get baptised, he's going to have to reverse transition back to being a male. Mm -hmm. So I think it just depends. Sometimes people are more lax in some areas um, in different parts of the country. Yeah, it, I'm sorry. There we go. Do you hear a lot of static? All of a sudden, through the end line, I do. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's been off and on. Okay. And so, um, before we move on to our next uh, topic, I want to get the Amish view here. Mary. So, um, yeah. So, personally, um, my family had a leather shop that was in our family for like generations upon generations. And I was around for five years old, and I only know this because my biological sperm donor was still alive. And I had followed this lady around the shop, and I was like, when I grow up, I'm going to marry her. I'm going to marry a woman, blah, 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 blah. That did not go over very well. And that is when I first remember being molested and sexually assaulted, and that continued for the next, like, 15 years. And it started, it all started with that incident. As far as like the church's official position, it's like not even talked about, it's so taboo. Like their homosexual people are considered to be sinners going to hell. They're gonna burn forever. So it took a really long time for me to actually be okay with that. Wow. And so then you, as, so as far as I'm aware of, I have never heard of an Amish practicing Amish person that is gay and it's okay. Or even like trans people, like it's literally not even talked about. It's a great evil. It's whispered about. 
behind closed doors. So you see the spectrum here, even on our panel, I would say Mormons, even though these are all fundamentalist religions who technically officially don't believe homosexual or believe homosexuality is a sin. I would say that just listening to the panel here, that the Amish seem to be a little bit more extreme, maybe Jehovah's Witnesses or maybe Mormons and then the Jehovah's Witnesses. I don't know. You guys tell it, let us know what you think in the comments. Uh, there is a, our next rapid fire question before we um, wrap up our stream here is was your cult always progressive on the matters of race relations? <laughs> now, I, now I, I had this question in mind because I would, the Mormon guy that I told you guys before we started the stream that was just so nice and just was like Jesus like, and I just love this guy. We had a little back and forth about whether or not the Mormon church now ever apologized for the, uh, for some of their practices in the past. And he kind of was going back and forth with me like they did. And I'm like, um, I don't think so. He's like, no, they did. I'm like, uh, I don't know. So maybe you guys can clear that up, clear that up, uh, yeah. for us about. <laughs> so, so, um, I, I know a fair amount about it, but what yeah, do you know? So, about? um, back in the day, you know, uh, for those of you who don't know, the LDS church was founded in like the late 1800s. It's like maybe 200 years old. But, um, you know, when it was founded, it, you know, it was a very uh, racially charged time in the country it was founded in, that being America. And I, I want to say it was up until the 50s when I read about it. I, I want to say it went up until about the 50s where black people like they could join the church, but people wouldn't be too big a fan about 78. it and, and they couldn't go into the temple at all. They were, you know, not very welcome in the church at all. Uh, and, and, you know, it took him a while. I, I want to say, I think it was the up until about the eighties where the church officially put out a stance on it. Andrea, maybe now, you can, can I, confirm it. Can I, yeah. But, but <laughs> let me take this. <laughs> yeah. I don't okay, know a whole so, lot about it. I just know that they weren't a, fans of blacks. No, yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I know a bunch. Um, okay, so Joseph Smith actually baptized several black people, but he was kind of funny about it. He, there was a black woman, in fact, there's a, a movie that's supposed to celebrate. It's, it's a big Utah Mormon movie, um, and I don't remember the name of it, but it's to celebrate this one black woman that was um, basically adopted into Joseph Smith's Joseph Smith's family was considered a sister, blah, blah, blah. But in reality, if you look at the details, she was not treated equally. It was not quite the same thing. It was definitely not as progressive. It was, um, it was progressive for the majority of people for that particular time. Um, but the second that Brigham Young got enough people into Salt Lake City, he, he put the ban on black people holding the priesthood. Mm -hmm. So there had not been a ban. There had not been very many member, black members, but there had been, and they had, um, you know, a, a few, four, five, anyway, a handful of black men were given the priesthood. Um, the women had the priesthood um, for, for a while, and it was never actually officially removed. If you, if you do the, the digging and look through all the literature. Um, However, it was officially removed for black people. And because the LDS church insists on um, certain types of things to only be able to go forward with a unanimous vote, um, the, the blacks were given the, the priest or that was basically the ban was lifted in 1978, the year I was born. Um, there were That is quite like a really people. recent. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. I know. And um, there were quite a few people who had been fighting just like Sam Young is currently fighting so hard and got excommunicated for trying to protect children from, you know, sexual abuse and, and sexual grooming because the LDS church genuinely is grooming children for these types of abuse, even if no abuse is actually happening because of the, the, the way that these interviews are set up. Um, mm -hmm. Same thing with, with the blacks getting the priesthood. People were being excommunicated left and right for fighting for exactly what the LDS church eventually did and then just pretended like it was all fine. And they allude to it being a mistake, 
but there is ne- there has never been an actual apology. There okay. has never been any of the, and most of the documentation that the church has is like official papers. They intentionally have hidden on their website where you have to know how to find it um, or search for it. Otherwise, you're not going to see it. So, so they technically are transparent, but, you know, make it as difficult as, as they can. Well, you, that's really interesting because as the light gets brighter, as we say in the ex Jehovah Witness community or the doctrines change, uh, they don't retro- go back and retro retroactively uh, unexcommunicate people because they've changed their mind yeah. about stuff. I mean, you just just out on the outs. So now, um, Mary, uh, no, I have not seen black Amish people. Is there a reason for that? <laughs> yes, there is a reason for that, actually. Like, I always ask people that question when they talk about Amish people because and race because here's the thing. If you've never seen a black Amish person, what do you think that means? And basically, I was told the story of how in the Bible, um, I believe it was Noah and his sons, and one of them went into the tent and saw his father shame, and then he was cursed. Um, I don't know the English name of his son, but anyway, so he was cursed. And so there was a whole story that I was told about how his people were cursed and that's why they're black, like pretty much. Um, Yeah, that one, the curse of canon. Um, Personally, I don't believe that some of my dearest friends happen to be people of color and that's, it just is what it is. But in the same token, I personally have never seen a black Amish person because they don't allow people in like that. They don't accept people very much. Wow. That is just interesting to me because 1978 is not that long. I know like with the, when you, you were talking to Andrea and then you saying that they don't allow uh, pretty much blacks period. I know well, they the don't Am- allow people in period. They have a right. very closed society. Right. But yeah. But so even with the yeah, we had quite a few black members before getting the priesthood. You know why they chose to join as their own whatever. But we yeah, we did. See, I'm just going to add in here. We were like obviously brought up to be non-racist, apparently. And I grew up with two black girls, and they're my best friends. And I never saw um, any racism. So. Obviously, a few years ago, in my XJW group, it comes up in the conversation. And the amount of people that told me that the racism they um, suffered in the organisation, to me, is shocking. Like, some were even told that they couldn't go and give talks at certain Kingdom Halls because they were black. And I was just like, whoa, this is supposed to be, like, the most non-racist organisation and that people saying that they had to go through that it shocked me like how much it ha- actually happened in some places we lost Spence again uh sorry about that <laughs> um so I, I don't know how far we got with the jehovah's witness view on race relations we know that they had separate congregations with blacks and whites during the uh time of so uh civil rights that was in the 60s so they were in separate congregations like the black blacks didn't meet with the whites down south uh, we have, if you guys are interested, I'll drop a link of the many quotes from the Jehovah's Witnesses regarding black people as being inferior or on a level mm. with even animals. Wasn't uh, there a quote that everyone in paradise was going to be white? Yes. And male, I think, as or, well, white and male. Well, females will turn into males or something like that. Yeah, and they'd all be white. Okay, so now here's the part, if you're wondering if your religion is a cult... This is probably a good measure to measure this by. Uh, Emma, do you want to lead us off with Jeho- the Jehovah's Witness views on cult or uh, excommunication and shunning, and then we'll go to Andrea and go around the glass table? Well, <laughs> basically, um, if you get found out for committing a sin and you're unrepentant, you'll get disfellowshipped, and that means that every Jehovah's Witness in your life will cut you off friends, family, whoever, and they will literally walk past you in the street. Um, I've been shunned by my mum and stepdad for 23 years now. They'll sit on a table in a restaurant next to me and act like they don't even know me. 
Um, and I've been told to strictly only contact them in emergencies. But that kind of makes me not even want to do that anyway, because, you know, why, why are you going to be there just for me in an emergency? Like, you can go to a family funeral and they will talk to you just for that one day. And then the next day they will treat you again like they don't even know you. So basically, you're treated like you are dead. Yeah, so um, you wanting the, the Mormon version of excommunication and shunning? Um, well, so officially, the church does not have any um, doctrines or teachings to shun. However, there's a lot of things um, that basically scare people or, or promises made that, that you know, because with a lot of promises also kind of comes the threat, like families can be together forever. They're supposed to be together forever. These are the things you're supposed to do. So then there's the fear of, okay, if something goes wrong and this person leaves, they're destroying the family. Um, when I told my husband that I was leaving, he said, he freaked out and was like, you're making me choose between you and the church. And I said, no, I'm not. But you, like, we had to have this whole conversation about that. Um, and so even though technically there's there's nothing that teaches that, it absolutely happens. And it happens to, you know, I mean, like anything, it happens to varying degrees. I have friends that when I told them, they were like, oh, my gosh, I'm I'm just so glad that you're doing what you need to do and that this is, you know, what you feel is right for you and stuff. I totally support you. No big deal. You know, I love you anyway. Just tell me how I can support you. And others that immediately unfriended me, won't have anything to do with me. I, you know, won't let their kids, you know, and, and even my, my children, I have uh, five kids, you know, that you're, you shouldn't be talking to the kids. You shouldn't be, you know, like all that, unless you're trying to now re, <laughs> re get the, my kids into the church. You know, there are people who, who want to do that, whatever. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, so, so it's, it's much more across the board, like, you know, just kind of a mess, but there's absolutely teachings within the church that covertly encourage shunning. And the, the excommunication process is grueling. It's intended to be shameful. It's intended to make you feel as bad as they possibly can. Um, I, I wish Sam Young was here because he could tell you about his process and how beautifully he handled it. I was not excommunicated. I, I chose to have my name removed and, and my, they say records removed, but really they don't actually remove any of your records. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a grueling process. And if you're a woman, you are in a room full of 12 men that grill you with details, if there's any sort of hint of sexual something, they grill you on the sexual details alone. There is no Twelve. other woman in the room with you. Yeah. I yeah. thought three, it, Jehovah's Witnesses do three men. I thought three was bad. Twelve. Nope. Yeah. It, it, it can be, uh, you know, six. It can be, but yeah, it's, it's a large number. You're supposed to have technically... One half of them are supposed to be there to advocate for the church, and the other are supposed to be there to um, support the, the person that's on trial. But in reality, that's not really how it works. They already assume that you're guilty. They don't, most of the time, they don't really know you that well personally. You know, sometimes they do. Um, but yeah, they're there to make sure that the church is protected. They, yeah, and it, it's horrible. Yeah. And, and I was I was going to be touching on some of that, the sexual connotations of certain things with the church. But, uh, you know, I guess we didn't get time for that. But uh, I, if you don't mind, I could pitch in here really quick with the perspective of leaving from, you know, forget I don't mean to be rude here, but from a younger point of view, I left when I was 14 and um, it, they do. It, it, they kind of make it your whole life. So, you know, when you're at school, most of your friends are also Mormons. When you're, you know, doing anything, you're mostly doing it with Mormons. I'll admit I was a pretty bad Mormon. I didn't go to a lot of the after church meetings or any of the young men, young women stuff. But 
they they kind of purposely get you in and it gets to the point where you know once you leave like andrea said you kind of get the half and half split where some people just don't really want to talk to you but then you get the people who are just so zealous that you know they feel like it's their duty to god or you know however they feel it to to get you back and to this day i left what coming on six years ago now to this day, I still get letters left on my door from the presidency. I mean, I live down the street from my old bishop, so, you know, it's small neighborhood and everyone's Mormon. So I still get letters left on the door. My sister still gets them, and they're still trying to invite you to young men, young women's. They're trying to get you to come to young adult singles ward, which they do on purpose so that you can marry into the church so that you could pay more tithe. Almost everything with the church comes down to tithing when you really think about it. But, you know... It, it 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 was kind of rough. I didn't have a lot of friends growing up anyways, but when most of them don't want to talk to you anymore because you don't go to church, and then you just get, you know, the people who, you know, come up to you when you're on the bus ride home from school, and they're like, hey, you know, haven't seen you at sacrament meeting in a few weeks. You, you coming back? Or, you know, is there anything we could do for you? Or, you know, they, they kind of purposely try and just guilt you into coming back almost. But, you know, that's going to change from person to person, ward to ward, but... You know, that's that's from from my own point of view of of leaving because I didn't officially leave like yourself and Andrea. I didn't, you know, have a meeting or anything. I just stopped going. And uh, like you said, the records. Fun fact, the LDS church owns like an acre of land up in Salt Lake where they have a giant underground bunker hollowed out in a mountain where they just have all your records from every single member on the planet. Wow. So that's kind of creepy. That's kind of Scientology esque. They have all your tithing records, any trouble you've been in with the church everything you've ever done officially for the church so just listening one. to the stories here i can, I can tell you what's different is that the witnesses all the witnesses we have a central governing body that uh there are no independent churches or break-offs or i mean there are some break-offs uh where uh from you know i some of them you know i guess i don't know if you consider it but i guess jehovah witnesses really a break off from the bible students if you really look at it but yeah um, like they still exist but the, don't they, but, the, right they the still bible exist bible student society so a action of shunning by the corporate office you are literally shunned by everybody across the world there is not a kingdom hall you can go to um and somebody will talk to you uh i should have mentioned as well sorry that go ahead if you're disfellowshipped uh, and then somebody who's still a witness hangs around with you then they can get disfellowshipped for associating with you so it'd be interesting to hear from the other guys here whether they get that same kind of treatment as well, well amish what about the amish how do well from what i the little i do know about the amish they do shun and um so if i don't know if you can see this but this is my tattoo that says shunned because that is what they did to me. Um, I have no regrets. This is kind of like, it's kind of a symbol because of how like when you were raised, like the only people you knew and you were allowed to freely associate with was Amish people, even if they harass you or abuse you or mistreated you, like that was the only people you were really allowed to be friends with. So that was all you had and that was all you knew. Um, if you do what I did, which is when I had the opportunity, I actually ran away from home at 19, um, I had this covering that I was wearing and I had a letter that I wrote to the ministry of the church. So each church district has a bishop, a deacon and three ministers. And then the whole community in that area, like for example, in Cashin, Wisconsin, they have 13 different churches, church districts the last time I knew. So twice a year they get together and they do what they call a dean of assembling and they write their new letter or they update their letter of rules and stuff like that. Like for example, one year, one of my brothers had a buggy seat cover that was green. And so one year, like they came out with a new rule in their ordinance brief that was, you can no longer have green buggy seats. And so everybody had to go and redo their buggy seats because now green is a sinful color to have on your fucking buggy seat, which I don't get or understand. <laughs> um, women and as a whole are never supposed to look men in the eye. They're never supposed to speak on a, on a direct level to a man. Like I've had some experiences and run-ins since like 
I became non-conforming. Um, so in 2004, December 2004, my oldest brother passed away. And when I went to his funeral, they sent a circle of 12 men out to prevent me from actually doing a walkthrough and viewing him after I sat in a sermon away from the family because I was shunned and I was placed in the bond. And because I was in the bond, they know I can't be considered part of his family now, apparently. Um, so they sent these men out and I was escorted off the property because I'm not allowed to say my goodbyes to my brother. And then when my stepfather passed away, they asked me not to attend the funeral. And I was like, okay, that's, that's cool. It's fine. Um, but when my biological mother passed away about four years ago, like up until the point that I went no contact with her, she would still write me letters that were like, oh, there's no hope for your soul. You're going to hell. The Avi Kafai on Brenna, which is like a forever everlasting fire and burning because they do kind of have a doomsday thing that's going on. Um, some of the things that they like won't do is like they wouldn't sit down and eat with me. They will not like take anything from my hand. They're not supposed to take any money from me. They're not supposed to help me. And like some of the things that she wrote in her letters up until like six years ago when I went no, no contact, um, she would say stuff like, I'm praying that it's hard for you so that you will return to the ways of your youth because you were granted this privilege of being born Amish. And so you should be Amish because that's your, um, that's what you're supposed to be. That's what God wants you to be. Um, she also wrote me a letter that was basically talking about how my rapist was at her house for the, their time that they had like one of their holidays and how it's so shameful that there's no hope for my soul blah, 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 all this stuff. And that was kind of where I drew the line and said, I can no longer associate with you in any form, shape or way. So yes, they do practice shunning. And in my case, they've never physically harmed me, but they did also do this thing where like I was being questioned because I still lived in the area for a while after I became non-conforming. Um, they would call the sheriff's department and my friends were being questioned and followed home from work because everything that happened in their community was my fault. Literally, like if somebody drove down the road and hit the gas or something and it scared their horse, they would call the sheriff's department and file a complaint. And so it just became a situation where I had to get out and I moved away because of that. Jesus. That's ridiculous. So sorry. I don't think it. Jesus had anything to do with it. <laughs> it it's ridiculous. ridiculous. <laughs> Force of habit. It's I, no. I, I bet the guy. <laughs> I'm sorry for you. That's very rough. I sorry you went through that. Yeah. And no, you I, know, um, I I would also like to say so. I left because of my sister. My sister was six years old when I left. Fifteen years later, I did go back and find her in. I said what I had to say to her. She told me never to speak to her again. And that I should have never come into her life. And then I asked if I could leave her a way to contact me. And she said that I needed to write it on a newspaper and place it on the floor because she could not take anything from my hand. I hope one day she picks up that newspaper and contacts me. Who knows? I never give up hope. Like I got my sister back after 14 years of her not talking to me. And she left the religion and contacted me and my brother. So I always say I never give up hope because more people are waking up now in these religions and cults than ever before. That's beautiful, Emma. Thank you. Yeah, that was part. You look quiet, Emma. Still there? Sorry, I was going to say, oh. you said you wanted to say something on Shunin, and then I muted myself halfway through by habit. 
No, uh, just uh, from what Mary was saying too, that was uh, very much related to uh, kind of my story. That was uh, my sister, she's been shunned for a long time and I'm, I actually still just have that hanging over my head. I'm still not officially out. Um, I've still been um, approached to try to get into a judicial committee is what they call our process. But uh, earlier this year in March, uh, I was the only person to attend my sister's wedding. No one else in the family was there. So, so yeah, so Mary's, so Mary's story was really tough. Like, I, I hope that eventually, yeah, things turn around for you and you're able to reconnect because I was able to reconnect with my sister last year and that was one of the things that was amazing. Yeah, that's beautiful. So, well, my sister got married about two years after I left and obviously recently she told me that the elders turned around to her and said, well, you could have invited your sister. <laughs> and I was like, well, that's a bit strange. Why would she invite her disfellowship sister to a wedding? Because yeah. I just have to like sit at the back anyway. It's just like... It's um, an opportunity to further shame you maybe. I don't know, but then she told me like when I left, I feel for you, Tyler. She told me when I left, like she cried herself to sleep at night. And it breaks my heart knowing that. But I knew when I left, I left my brother and sister behind. And I hated the fact that my brother was 15 at the time. And it's making me like well up thinking about it. And I wanted to take him with me. But I knew legally there's no way I could have gotten away with that. And he said to me recently, like, I wish you would have took me. And I was like, I couldn't. Um, but my sister was like 18, 19, engaged, getting married. So I knew there was no way like she would leave. But looking back, I felt so guilty because I walked away and left them behind. But I knew I had to go. I could not stick it out any longer. I, I was done. But it was still like, I still remember that day walking away. But it's never left my mind. Thank you all yeah, for I mean, sharing I your wasn't, I wasn't even like baptized. That's That's what it's called when a, like you become a full-fledged full-time if you get out like I even if you're just studying and all that but like baptism is that point when you become a full-fledged member when you have you can marry you can have the privileges and all that you know bullshit and and i didn't i was getting ready to do that when i when my mother realized what was going on and well um definitely not gonna defend her because she was an abusive fuck but basically that the thing is that i wasn't even baptized so i couldn't even be disfellowshipped but um jehovah's witnesses who know me like uh, who, who were there in the kingdom halls in when i grew up they they would not speak to me my adoptive family who raised me wouldn't speak to me like uh, after years of not speaking to me and after i you know i hid my adoptive sister from the police when she ran away from home from her abusive father and all that and uh, then she turned around got married got, went back to the kingdom hall and started to shun me until this year because COVID-19 is happening and now they reach out to anyone and everyone to try and get them back to the Kingdom Hall and you know I told her well look I'm an apostate so unless you can answer me these questions in a satisfying manner so as I you have can see there's a, a, a sorry guys I, I'm trying to multitask between life and life live streaming <laughs> um, <laughs> there there is a range or a spectrum of even with shunning between all of these cults and even within the Jehovah, we actually did a uh i don't know if you can look at uh emma's poster in the back there um if you're not familiar mm -hmm. with some of the uh work that she does where she says shunning kills can you see it it's a tribute to those who have been shunned if you guys missed our last stream, our, our live stream i believe it was the last last week or the week before last mm -hmm. uh where we yeah. talked about the effect of shunning within the Jehovah Witness re uh, uh, religion. Before we close out our live stream today, I, I had a few more questions, but I'm just going to pick a question out of the ones that I thought 
uh, we can answer. And then we can all go and around the glass table and give closing thoughts um, if you want to. Um, I think this is a really big, big one. And Mary, I don't know if you want to start us off, Mary, on <laughs> Colt's view on sex and dating. Ha. Huh. <laughs> wow. <laughs> So remember, I said I lived in five di five different communities, right? right. Um, so, in one community, like it was more or less, so they have their Amish youth groups. They call them singings, and they happen on a Sunday. And they have like a, it, it can range be, uh, at the age that these kids start attending the youth groups. In some communities, it's sixteen. Some of them, it's seventeen. Um, out of those five communities that I lived in. There was only one that started at 16 attending the singings. Um, the other things that can range is like in some communities, um, when they have a date, so they go to the singing and then at the singing, like they'll have the girls and boys separated. They'll do their singing for an hour or an hour and a half, depends on the community's policy. And then after the singing, the girls all go outside to like the washroom area where the laundry is done and stuff. And the boys go outside to the barn and then the boys will have like two of them will come up and they'll ask this girl if she'll go on a date with this guy. And you're supposed to say yes, unless your family doesn't approve of that family. Okay. And then the boy will like pull up his buggy and the girl will go out and get in the buggy. He'll give her a ride home and then here's where it gets crazy. So like <clears throat> in one community that I lived in, what they did is they would sit at the kitchen table across from each other and have a oil lamp lit and they would sit there until like midnight and then the boy would go home and the girl would go to bed. In another community, they would go upstairs. The girl would go upstairs to her room and get in her night clothes and lay in bed. And then the boy would go put up the horse and the buggy and then come upstairs and go to her room, get in his night clothes. And then they would bundle, they would practice what's called bundling. And they would spend there until like about four o'clock in the morning. And then the boy was supposed to go home. Oh, but no premarital sex guys. Just what's bundling. That? Just, just bundling. All right. In, in another well, we can do no bundling. I want to know about <laughs> <laughs> bundle was out as the XJ dub. But go that's ahead. Some, that's some degeneracy for you. Some good of pornia. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, remember, premarital sex is a sin. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, but then another community is like they didn't do the whole like the practice of bundling, but they also didn't sit at the kitchen table. What they would do is they would have a big chair in the living room and then the boy would go in there and sit in the chair and then the girl would come in and sit in his lap okay like can you just tell us what bundling is though please is that just like hugging or no touching or they're bundled in the blankets all night long so what they just like cuddle or <laughs> like is it is it like betting <laughs> You roll yourself up into a sushi roll in your duvet, like. But uh, you're okay. doing it with another person. There's, these are teams. <laughs> they have like hormones. I bet the uh, I bet the awkward cuddle boners are really but, bad. Okay, in question that for you. <laughs> question for you, if you don't mind, because in 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 the Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, even. If you like, if you're a guy or even a girl, whatever, but if you sleep with like your blanket or pillow between your legs and you have a vacuum, mm -hmm. that's a sin. Is that something similar in this case? Like, if, if you you're go to a to masturbate, <laughs> and okay, you so here's the crazy part like, you're not supposed to masturbate, but I sat in church and listened to somebody confess to sinning because he fucked his cats. Masturbation is good, but anyways. Oh my! Oh, I hope he's loving like animals. Oh Jesus! I hope the RSPC. Uh, I don't know who he is. Right, well, I, I guess with the Jehovah's Witnesses, we had everything covered. We had lists of stuff you couldn't do. No oral sex. No, I mean obviously, I mean it, we talk about within the marriage. I mean, mission. Yeah. The only thing you could really do was missionary. Well, we were uh, only supposed to have sex to procreate. 
Sorry. Wow. Okay, now that's interesting. That's a common one, I think, is like your a lot of religions, it's sexual intimacy is exclusively for the, the process of procreation. And uh, I believe it's Orthodox Jews to take that to just a whole nother level, but, you know. Well, don't they classic? Yeah, aren't they the ones who have sexual? sexual? Sorry. I'm sure Jehovah's Witnesses. You mean the sheet? Jehovah's Witnesses class anything like um, oral or going in the back door as homosexual. So that's why it's not allowed. When I was a yeah. still a ministerial servant as a witness a couple years back, I was removed from that position because my wife and I had engaged in either oral or anal sex. Okay, well, I, we wow. were re removed, but we were, uh, uh, my husband and I were reproved for it. Wow. I, I, mean, as I was a, told as by our church over here, yeah. I was told by our circuit overseer that I was following the example of the demons. <laughs> so yeah, because the, the witnesses Forget police your bedroom now. Do the Mormons police your bedrooms as much as the witnesses? So have the underwear. There's there's a um, there's a, a common thing I've heard about in uh, LDS meme circles, and I'm gonna be 100 percent with you. I you know I don't know where it started, but there's, there's something Andrea might have heard of this called soaking, and soaking is where uh, two people who are not married. Uh, the man will insert himself into the woman and then nothing else. He'll just sit there like that. And the idea is because what? he's not, uh, because, because he's not, uh, you know, in and out that it's not a sin. Now I'm going to say this. I've never in my entire life ever actually heard of anyone doing that, but I do know some people who probably would. <laughs> so... I don't oh know. Okay, so wow. we got soak, soaking, bundling. What else? What else? We got? <laughs> well, I was well, engaged. Yeah. I was engaged to um and JW guy, and um obviously we had to have a chaperone everywhere we went. So I either had to have my brother with me or my sister with me because we wasn't allowed to be alone. There always had to be three of you. I wasn't even allowed to get in his car and go on a short car journey. Because they just presumed that we were going to stop off somewhere in the lay by and have sex. Like it was ridiculous. But there was lots of things that they consider is it heavy petting and you're not allowed to touch a boob or you're not allowed to touch this or do that. You're not allowed to kiss for too long. But to be honest, we did a lot of stuff that Wait, we you were allowed to kiss? Not for too long. In here, they taught us, here they taught us if you kiss him on the cheek, cheeks before marriage, that's like pornea. Like well, no, no no that's we, no because we was allowed to yeah, kiss, because there had to be there had to be somewhere st someone stood there watching which was very <laughs> awkward <laughs> so, <laughs> that's almost worse for us it was like, I you had to be engaged you were engaged uh, yeah. that's, well, that's, not a, that's not a church rule not a Mormon church rule. Yeah. But I remember my stepdad sitting me and him down and gave us this pep talk about things you shouldn't be doing was like yeah we'd never do that we never do that and we were both sitting there thinking well we was doing that last night but we're not gonna say anything <laughs> so I, I did loads of stuff but i i just never confessed or i was like, i'm not telling them so oh i confessed everything <laughs> well did that, that oh, i did too i did too <clears throat> i used to get in trouble just because that, I'm yeah. confessing. What you were saying there about an adult talking to you as a child, or uh, not as a child, but as a youngin about things you can and cannot do. Um, I was 20 at the time, so it wasn't like a child. <laughs> so, I mean. Yeah, but I remember, and I remember like they told us. 24 or 26, so like it was so embarrassing. But that, that comes down to kind of the, the original thing that I uh, had said. I forget where I said it, but where you had asked me to come on here. Which is um, the the temple recommends stuff where you are, I you know me as a, I was twelve years old at the time. That's when you first get the I believe Aaronic priesthood, and you're allowed to go, get your temple recommend. And that's when you sat down in a room with a bishop, who is usually a boomer white dude, and you have to sit across from this guy, and he's going to ask you, "Hey, you know, are you keeping to the laws of chastity?" Are you doing this? Are you doing this? And then he, they kind of get into detail with the law of chastity where they say, are you masturbating? Are you watching pornography? Are you, you know, doing this or that? And by the way, that's the first time in my entire life that I remember looking a grown man in the eyes and lying. 
Mm. Hey, Pops, my grandpa's watching this. Um, <laughs> let me go ahead and what I have here um, a, a person I lived with. She was raised Mormon. And uh, one of you asked me to, to grab her, you know, experience here. So she mentions here, you know, all this stuff where she was asked again by a boomer white dude at 12, you know, uh, keep the law of chastity, not watching porn. Are you going to church paying tithing? And then it comes down here. Uh, she was asked about her virginity, uh, about if she masturbates. And then she also wanted me to mention this here. Um, she was uh, raped, by the way, uh, towards the beginning of college. And uh, her rapist, I, I, you, I don't believe it was, you know, penetrative, but it, she was sexually assaulted by a man. Uh, that man, the church, uh, she reported it to the church and the church did not do anything about it. Not only did they not do anything about it, but he served a mission just about six months after that. So they let him do one of the most important things in the Mormon church, which is going on a mission. So right. even though the, he, there, it was on record that he had sexually assaulted her, she was not allowed to, you know, no, nothing was done about it. He wasn't punished in any way. And in some ways he was even, you know, borderline rewarded. Now, I don't Members are told to report before even going to the police, R report to the church, report to your bishop. Yeah. So, I think my grandfather is still listening because he just sent me a text message I'd like to read. I don't know if he's making a joke here, but he said, Baptists are not allowed to make love standing up because if someone catches them, they'll think they're dancing. <laughs> you know what? I think there are some restricted Baptist that texts that don't allow dancing and stuff like that. So, yeah. Well, in, in, in uh, the Mormon thing, and I think the Catholics do it as well, where it's the leave room for the Holy Ghost. Yeah. We'll dance, and you have to dance like eight inches apart. No, I heard that. that I've be heard a law that in, in a couple of towns in Utah. Yeah. That, yeah, it was literally law. No one ever you asked me to a dance because I'm, you know, a fat neck beard. So no one ever asked me to a dance. But uh, I did, so I don't have personal experience, but I did see it happen. <laughs> I yeah, mean, I but, was told. Uh -huh. Sorry. I was told oh, I, not to laugh when men are funny. Yeah. Like, uh, and, and mind you, I was 16 tops when I left fully. Yeah. So I was like a literal child. And. Never mind the fact that old boomer men came up to me and said, sister, you should be more careful with the way you dress. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then second, when, you know, we, we would have guests over and that's usual, was a usual and is a usual like JW thing to do here where I live. Like they would just get together, throw a grill party with other uh, other families with kids and just have fun or fun, you know. Yeah. Did they also and, tell you to laugh too yeah. loud? Yeah. Okay, so we are in, approaching the end of our stream. We actually a little over our normal uh, uh, stream. So what we're going to do is go around the glass table and uh, you know, if, if you have any closing thoughts or anything you'd like to say. I know I... I, I for me, I would probably would want to say that if you are a ex a Jehovah current Jehovah's Witness out there doubting, uh, you are not alone. There are a, a lot of people who are in your position who are still attending meetings and are still feeling like uh, they don't have a way out. Uh, there are a lot of ex Jehovah Witness groups that you can join. Emma has one. Uh, there, if you are a Jehovah's Witness. Uh, Doubt and doctrine or anything like that. You can reach out to any of the uh, the extra hope witnesses on this uh, panel, um, as well as we recently did a live stream on the effects of suicide and shunning within the Jehovah's Witnesses. So before you think that you should take your life, uh, be due to the shunning uh, policies of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Reach out to one of the any of the extra hope witnesses here, um, as well as in our last stream we had a lot of. Uh, numbers that you could call uh for suicide hotline for any type of uh help in that area um so that would be a spencer's closing thought uh emma did you have any thoughts 
Yeah, kind of the same. Um, I've run my group now for ex Jehovah's Witnesses for 12 years, but I also let in other um, ex, like there is, that's how I met her, Mary, because like there's an ex Amish, there is ex Mormons in my group because we've all got something like in common. We've all been through the same. Um, so if you're having any doubts, come join the group. I've also got a group, especially for the public that want to learn more about Jehovah's Witnesses, if you've got them in your life or you want to know more about the beliefs. Um, it's called Jehovah's Witness, what, what, Jehovah's Witnesses, what do they believe? And that will give you more like in-depth information on the beliefs. So um, my group is ex Jehovah's Witnesses Unite. So if you have any doubts, if you're studying and you want to come and chat to people, then feel free to come and join. Andrea? Yeah. Um, man, um, I, I would recommend people go to um, the Protect All Children Facebook page, and, and there's also a group. Um, there's a lot of people there that are, are very supportive and for, for ex-Mormons and will help direct you um, to, to where, the, where you need to go. Um, for that, Sam Young is one of the admins for that and, and has really um, taken this uh, cause head on of that, that children should not be groomed and set up for sexual abuse in any religion, um, you know, let alone just the LDS religion. But of course, um, our, the, the group has a lot of, of Mormons, so there's a lot of support there. There's a lot um, to, to talk, so you can, can reach out there um and then of course there's also lots of ex-mormon groups there i mean there's a lot of us <laughs> there's a whole lot of us that have left and it's hard because you know something that takes up that much of your time every week and is intended to be basically your extended family and then you leave you're basically starting over so so yeah if you if you have doubts if you have questions if you need support um there are so many resources and uh, you can contact me personally. I'm, I'm more than happy to direct you to whatever would be more specific to, to what your needs are. So, yeah. Cal? Um, Sam did really want to come on, but he's going away for the weekend. So he said you will definitely come on a future show. Because he, he opened my eyes to the whole moment thing. All right, Cal? Yeah, so... Um... You know, I wish I had the the kind of resources y'all do. I'm going to be honest. Once I left the the church, I just kind of left it at that and walked away. And I, I didn't really get into any of the activism or anything. So I wish there were places I could direct people. And if anyone had any questions, I wish I could answer them. But I'll be honest, I'm not, you know, obviously the best the best person for that. Um, but, uh, you know. What would it, you say to people that are having doubts then? I would say just think. Think hard. Think long and hard. Look into it. Um, there's a lot of things that just don't quite match up when it comes to big organized, especially Abrahamic religions. And, you know, I would say, do your research. Hey, Joseph Smith, right? That's how he started the church, he says. He sat down and he prayed and he thought about it. So maybe pray if that's what you need. If you need God in your life and you think your church isn't doing it for you, do some praying, do some looking. Um, look for things that just don't add up. Um, I'd also really quick like to say that I noticed specifically here in the, the comments here on the StreamYard channel, um, I believe it was uh, Tanya and David had some very nice things to say, and I appreciate that. I didn't have it as bad as a lot of the other panelists here, um, you know, and for that I'm grateful, but, you know, I'd, things are going to get better, maybe sooner than later, maybe later than sooner, but... You know, when, you, when you're not being guilted over every single thing that you do and you're not always constantly worrying about a God with seemingly contradicting points, things are going to get better. And, you know, I, I'm a firm believer that, it, you know, whatever gets you through the day, do you need, you know, a cigarette? Do you need God? Do you need whatever? If it's what gets you through your day, you know, go for it. And some religions just aren't cut out for you. But if you need it, I recommend you find one that is. Oh, thank, um, thank you so much. I'm sorry. I, I, I guess I was on mute. Tyler, did you have any final thoughts? 
Uh, no, I guess I would just like to say, I mean, I don't know more I'm really going to have to add that isn't, hasn't already been said, but especially thank you to everyone that's on. Did we lose Tyler? Oh, there you go. Awesome. Um, no, reach out to some online community. Um, the XJW Reddit uh, has mm -hmm. been huge. Um, if you are a current Jehovah's Witness, uh, jwfacts.com is a great right. resource for uh, really the truth about what your religion really has been up to. Um, so, again, thank you to all the different, um, the ex-Mormons, the ex-Amish. Uh, it's great to uh, have uh, people on this panel. Thank you. Thank you. And Molly, did you have any final thoughts before we go to Mary? Uh, yes, yeah, so basically the same sentiments the others have shared. If you have doubts, reach out and mainly, yes, hi, I'm the apostate your mama warned you about. I'm not trying to sell you to Satan. It's fine. You can interact with me and I, I swear to God, I'm not going to drag you down to hell. I'm not, not going to like gut your kids and eat your liver or some <laughs> shit like that. I'm not going to drink your blood. I'm cool. I, I'm chill. I'm just a little bit gay, but other than that, you know, I, I usually can hang with anyone and everyone, as long as you don't try to, you know, shove your Bible down my throat, I'm going to keep my atheism out of the conversation as well. Easy. Thank you. You know, uh, um, Mary, you are giving me some good information here. I'm going to have to see if I can flash this across the screen. Did you have uh, some final thoughts? Mary, I think you are on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, as far as the like born Amish community, the people that are non-conforming, um, we don't have a lot of resources. It's been something that has been an ongoing problem. Most of the resources that we have is like, for example, um, I have a niece who became non-conforming and she joined another extremely conservative church. And when I came out of the closet, like she kind of is no longer in my life because of that. Um, so like there's a lot of religious resources for people who are trying to leave the Amish, but you would have to conform to that religion. So it doesn't seem like we have any secular resources. Now I do want to say as far as like the LGBTQ community, we do have a suicide hotline through for them specifically through like the Trevor Project. Right. Um, that one is a really good resource if you ever need assistance because sometimes you can get a less than helpful interaction with a suicide counselor if they maybe believe in Jesus or something like that. Like sometimes they'll say things that just kind of make you fall off the deep end. And so it's good to have that for the LGBTQ community. And I just, I'm hoping that one day we will get to a place where we have a secular um, group that will be prepared to provide resources and assistance to those who are not conforming Amish, but we're not there yet. No, we're not. Most of the help groups or um, support groups are leaning toward religious. Uh, they're religiously themed. Um, I would have to say that there is another one here. I'm going to see if I can grab their number. It's called Recovering Religion. Um, if you guys are not familiar with that. But before, I'm going to dig up that number. And Cal, did you, you have a final thought? Yeah, I, so I, I'd just like to say one more thing. Um, sure. And I'll try and keep it very brief. But, you know, Something that I have no statistical backing for this, but I think something that is very common in, in organized religion and especially religions with cultish behavior is it kind of makes your your mental place not where it should be. It, it really instills a lot of guilt in you and a lot of doubt in you. And when I was young, I I had a lot of depression issues that I didn't recognize as that. and I, I didn't know what was going on. And you know, I, I didn't have a great way to, to go about searching for any help for that. And I, I kind of resisted help anywhere I could get. And it got to the point where I have in my life had a, a loaded firearm in my mouth before. And 
no one should get to that point, you know, and if you're in a religion, you know, we got these numbers flashing. I was always just too nervous to even try and you shouldn't be, you, there's nothing wrong at all with getting help. But recently in my life, within the last couple of years, I've been seeing, you know, professionals about it and you should absolutely be doing that, you know, and if people, you know, you're going to get the people in your life who are going to say, suck it up. And for some people that works, but, I wholeheartedly recommend that you do. And there's the numbers going up on the screen as well. If you Google suicide hotline, they do have a chat and whatever you can do. If you can get to see someone, do it. If, if you can't, don't be afraid to call the hotlines. Don't get to the point where I was. And I couldn't tell you if where I was, was because of my religion or because of just what's going on in, up in the noodle bowl. But I would say, don't let yourself get there. Cause that's a horrifying place to be and it's just, it's bad just don't you seek help don't be nervous don't be ashamed especially do not be ashamed because people are going to be like that you, you might just be like that sometimes it's genetic sometimes it's just due to the way you were brought up but please don't get to that point do find that help that you need Thank you so much. And that is very important because um, as we talked about before in our live streams that some people, a lot of people have killed themselves over the, over the policies of certain religions because of their lack of uh, support. Um, if you need support, the recovering religion peer support hotline is now on it. It's kind of simple. There are other, if you go to their website, the recovering religion website, they have a lot of support. Uh, for you but and they have numbers uh, for you in the UK and a bunch of other numbers here I couldn't fit them all on the screen here uh, thank you so much Cal thank you so much Andrea Mary Tyler and everybody that uh, joined us on the um, panel today um, thank you for sharing your stories and trusting us of, of uh, with your stories on this platform um, we want to thank everybody thank in the in the comments everybody on periscope twitter youtube i don't know i didn't see too many youtube people from from our youtube people today mm. um so that's a little concerning that's i don't know if that has to you're right that was, i mean i don't know if that was upstairs so if he if he was on i don't know the youtube link is the one i sent to my grandpa so maybe he okay was there. i don't know maybe so or maybe y'all just quiet grandpa, ignore, the, ignore the sex stuff i talked about please ignore <laughs> that mean, one I I'm impressed you watched, to be honest. Yeah. You're watching upstairs. Hey, I'll be up in a minute. <laughs> All right, guys. So we're going to go ahead and sign off and say goodbye. Make sure you join us next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.